Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, Roger and is that Chuck? Are you? Yes. Yes, Dr. Yes, Ball, this is here. Roger. Yes, and that's Chuck, right? Yes, Chuck is here. Hi, Roger. Is here. This is Rick. Glad to have you here. We have a couple more people showing up, and then we'll get started. Any questions while we wait? No, uh, I had uh, read the, uh, th about the three E's and took notes, but uh, I'm trying to bring up the, the slide anyway. All right. Oh, oh, what ears am I talking about? Hello? Hello. Who's this? Hey there. This is Wesley. Hi, Wesley. Good to hear your voice again. How you doing? <laughs> Good to hear yours too, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Waiting for two more. Okay. Wesley, Chuck is on the phone and Roger is on the phone. So, okay. What's up, guys? Hey. How's Chuck? How you doing? Real good. Right. I'm glad to hear other men on the call. <laughs> All right, somebody else just popped in. Hi. Hi, this is Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Welcome. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? I'm excellent. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. All right, we're waiting for Lisa. Can you get Lisa on? Hi, I'm Come here. On. It's Lisa. Oh, Lisa, you're on. I'm on. I just got on. Excellent. Welcome. Well, then we can get started. Good to see you. Sweetie Lisa, you've been on before, haven't you? Your name yes, was last familiar. year. Yes. What was the, what did you, what was the presentation then? Oh, my gosh. You're asking me to do a recall on last year. Um, <laughs> a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> um, give me a second here, and I'll tell you. It was uh, gender at the mediation table. Oh, fantastic. Wow. Well, you either have a fabulous memory or excellent record-keeping skills. <laughs> good record-keeping. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody. We can go ahead and get started. There's actually an awful lot to cover. I know we rushed through uh, gender at the mediation table. This one might might also we need to push through it pretty quickly. Do you all see slides in front of you? Is there uh, no. No. There should be a slide that says, Welcome to Live Webinar. PowerPoint so presentation. Is this web? Yes, oh, I have that. Yeah, I, I do too. It says, Best Option. And hopefully, right. all of your <clears throat> computer speakers are muted. So, yes. Yes, I don't have that slide. That one slide? Um, no, I've so got the option. Welcome to. Welcome to the live webinar. Right. Um, that's, that's good. That's what you should have. Okay. Any, anybody not have it? Mine just okay. says, welcome to the event. Enjoy the presentation. Click here to listen in. Okay. You should click here to listen in. And if there's a button that says click, click here for the presentation, go ahead and click that. But mute your speakers when you. Okay. I'm here. I got the slide. You have it. All right, now it should say three E's of conflict. Yes. yes. It's a perfect. I love it when technology works. Why don't you say welcome to live webinar? Oh, well, it should refresh. There should be a refresh coming up because we just changed slide. Okay, it just did it then. It said conflict response training, the three E's. Yes. Very good. All right, let's jump in, and hopefully those slides will keep up. Was that Wesley that it was slow on? Yes, it's Wesley. Yeah. All right. Okay, so to, tonight, what we're going to look at, the next slide says agenda. We're going to spend some time looking at how conflict works. What I have seen over the 10 years that I've been working with conflict and studying conflict is that most of us misunderstand conflict terribly, um, and most of what we do is organize around conflict avoidance skills as opposed to any real conflict management 
you know, and if we just took the time to look at the science of conflict, to, to look at the mechanisms inside what happens when certain triggers are pulled, and what are the responses to those, and what direction does conflict go when those options are created, then we could have a better understanding of how to resolve conflict. I've seen a lot of people end up using techniques that literally escalate conflict, make it worse, uh, rather than facilitate any kind of a resolution. Second thing we're going to look at is conflict communication. Communication is hard enough as it is being able to understand someone. We all come to communication with a particular lens, filters, interpretations in our mind, and that's just around the words, which represent only 7% of communication. You add to that body language, voice tone, age difference, geography difference, life experiences. I mean, all other kinds of differences. Communication is hard. It becomes even worse when we drop into conflict, and there are particular dynamics that it starts to take on. So that's where we're headed. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. But I want to start, first of all, to get you each to take a minute or two to think about a conflict, a conflict you've recently had, something that either you've witnessed or has happened to you personally, recently or in the past. And the two Ps are on there, either personally, in a personal setting, or either in a professional setting, either one. I'll give you a minute, if you could, jot some notes down in front of you. What was that conflict about? What were the issues? Who, were, who was involved? All right, does everybody have something in their heads at least? Yeah. Yep. I'm not going to ask you to share it necessarily. Um, but my goal is that as we're going through this, I want you to think about your own experience. If any of this has any truth to it, it should reflect in your own experience. It should, you should be able to identify you, the things that were happening to you in your conflict. As we go, does everybody have one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Anybody need more time? You just really have an awful conflict, and it's just taking a long time to write it down. No. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Very good. Let's jump in. I have two questions I want to ask, and I'd like a response from you. How many people does it take to have a conflict? One. Yeah, I'd agree. One. Two. Just one. Yeah. Just one. A lot of people often answer that question, there's two. It takes two people to have a conflict. But my experience is conflict always begins with one person. Somebody is hurt. Somebody is disappointed. Somebody is uh, damaged in some way. And it smolders, or they think about it, or they just blurt it out. And then, because they have brought the information to the second person, now there's two people involved. As opposed to, and of course, we can always have a conflict with ourselves. If anybody's ever been in a diet plan uh, or an exercise routine, I, I'm speaking from personal experience here, I tend to, it's always a conflict to stand in front of that chocolate sundae ice cream and consider the possibility of counting points or ignoring it or I'd much rather have it. So I have a conflict with myself right there between two different sets of goals right there inside. But with conflict happening, somebody ends up disappointed, somebody ends up hurt, and then they take it to the other person. We tend to characterize conflict only with loud conversation or loud dialogue or raised emotion which has become the problem that we only associate emotions or uh, what do we call reactive emotions around conflict. I think we'll, we'll get to that later. Second question, 
how would you go about convincing somebody to do something you were asking them to do if they didn't want to do it? How would you go about convincing them? Well, appealing to their uh, sense of reasoning by your interpretation. Okay. So appeal to their sense of reason. What would you bring to the table that would convince them that your request was reasonable? Something that they could identify with. Okay, something they could identify with. Try to convince them, because you're not going to convince them to do something if your argument is poor, right? So either a poor argument isn't going to convince them or a good argument is going to convince them. So you want your argument to be as good as it possibly can, right? Yeah. yeah. Anybody yeah. else? What would you do to convince somebody? Um, facts. Um, facts, okay. So I've got to have some evidence, maybe some facts to, to shore up my rational presentation. Know anybody else? Persuasion. Persuasion. Okay, what would you use that would be persuasive? Well, I try not to go that route being that, um, I was in your negotiation class, and I know better. But uh, I've seen people like <laughs> they um, so like they get into a, like a conflict or whatever, and they'll go about expressing facts like what you know um, what she just said. But then also, um, if you don't agree with the facts that they are talking about, then they'll start like switching it and then trying to make you feel bad, like maybe like calling you stupid, you're an idiot, or trying to make it like you don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, those type techniques making you like feel bad or persuading you to come on come on over to their side to agree with them so they won't have to keep talking about you. Right. Yes. Some sort of I've got to escalate somehow if if I, once we start to get to the persuasion side of things. So these are the two things we're going to look at, or it kind of opens up for us a peek into how conflict works because these two things I think are critical as we start to analyze conflict. One, how many people does it take to have a conflict, and how do people go about convincing another person? So let's jump in. Any questions so far? Yep. All right, here we go. We have here's the three E's. You start out with an event or an incident, something that has happened, or in some cases, something that didn't happen that was supposed to happen, and also that's why I named it an event, because it could be something that wasn't done. It's a triggering piece that says, Whoa, 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 something's wrong here. Second E of every conflict is there's an explanation that now ensues, an explanation part that becomes characteristic of every conflict. And then because of those two, in the event of the explanation, an expectation is created. So that's the three E's of conflict. Thanks for spending your time with me tonight. Have a good night. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's all I promised, right? Was the three, give you three E's. There they are. Now let's break them down. Let's talk about events. Something happens. Somebody says something. Somebody does something. Somebody doesn't say something or someone doesn't do something. Uh, forget an anniversary. Turn a report in late. Um, says something with a bit of an edge to it that's taken the wrong way. That moment in time, the person who has received this event, or just, you know, what the, it's happened to them, has two choices. They can either let it go, or they must engage. Now, here's what's fascinating. Both of these, both choices, take a great deal of energy. You are going to expend energy in either one of these two choices. It takes a whole lot of work and effort to let 
something go. And with all the workplace disputes I've seen, people have a tendency to, okay, yeah, I'm not going to fight about that. You know, well, I'll let that go. Ah, that's not worth it. I don't have time to invest in that. But it still festers. It becomes evidence for the next time something goes wrong. And then you're going, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. I oh, put those two things together. It's never really gone. It's never really resolved. So all that energy to keep letting it go, to have to keep coming back to make sure that I've let it go, both of these takes a great deal of energy. Engaging means I'm going to come to the person and I'm going to confront them. Now, with communication skills, I can confront them in a very professional, healthy, uh, adult-like way. You know, what you said the other day in, in the hall, that, that, that remark that you made, it, it bothered me, and, and I just wanted to come to you and, and talk about that. Good communication could make that engagement quite nice, right? So still, I'm bothered. I've engaged. I've come to this other person, and I've engaged them with something that has bothered me. That automatically creates the exploration. That thing I just said about, you know, that remark you made in the hall, that gesture, you know, I, I, you probably didn't mean it, but, and here, I, what I'm doing now is I'm organizing my interpretation of that event, and I am presenting it to this person in the way, hoping that they will see my point of view, because what comes next is a description of its impact on me, what was done and its impact on me. So what is basically going on is a formula. If there's a conflict, if someone was hurt, some wrong was done, and there's a victim, not just that a wrong was done, but that it was done to somebody and it had an impact, those two things together, organizing this justification, this explanation, creates the need for repair. So I'm going to reach out to this other person. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I'm going to explain it. And then because of the event and the explanation, the way I've organized it, I've framed it and justified it in order to convince them to do something or not do something or to stop doing something. That automatically, all explanation around the of triggering event creates an expectation. Justification, all the work I went into, would you please not do it again? Would you please apologize? Would you please give me $10 million? Because damages, hurts, and all that stuff. It always creates that expectation. So I am going to do my explanation in such a way that it is going to optimize the chance that you're going to accept my request. Would you please don't do it again? At that moment in time, as two things can happen as a response. The person who has heard my explanation, heard my description of the event, will do one of two things. They'll either hear it, and for whatever reason, maybe I'm a brilliant orator, Maybe I organize my facts incredibly well. Maybe they just don't want to bother with me. And they go, yes, I will never do that again. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to come across that way. Or they reject and refuse my request. No, I'm not going to apologize. I didn't do anything wrong. You're just too sensitive. At that moment in time, once those three E's are engaged, if we do the acceptance and understanding, conflict's over. Yes, I apologize. I won't do that again. Yes, you're right. I shouldn't have done it. Here's a check. Whatever the request is, it's fulfilled. That conflict's done. Both people walk away. However, the minute that thing's rejected, the minute the request is refused, we automatically drop into stage two conflict. Now, here's what's fascinating. Communication skills, all that is necessary to end the conflict 
at the stage one level. That's all that was necessary. Well-framed argument, nice justification, reasonable request, and the other person says, yes, we're done. If they say no, stage two takes on a very different route. And it's motivated then by two fatal myths that we bring to conflict management across the board. That first myth is that my communication skills should be able to resolve this conflict. I mean, that's what would have worked at the beginning. And it's what works in all the times when someone has good communication skills and the other person accepts it. So all I need to do is apply more gooder <laughs> communication skills. And that is a fatal mistake because it's stage two and from stage two on, communication skills are not sufficient to resolve a conflict. Second fatal mistake, and this is a mistake of our culture, we are so inundated with a litigious courtroom model of how to manage conflict. We see it on television. I mean, we've been enculturated for hundreds of years through a court model of managing disputes. We fundamentally believe and assume that facts and evidence is what will sway the other person. And that is a fundamental, fatal mistake. And here's a brief reason why. We can get more into it later, or if you want to ask questions, we can go into it deeper. Facts and evidence are critically important in any context where someone is making a judgment or a ruling. And what that means is a judge is sitting on a, on a stand or a jury box is filled with people who will make a decision about someone's future. Anytime we're in that context, I want the facts and the evidence to be persuasive. I want these folks to make the best decision they can because they're playing with someone's life. But in a conflict management situation, there's no one there to make a judgment or a ruling. If I was hurt by you and I come to you, or you were hurt by me and you come to me, there's not a judge or a jury. Yet the model we tend to keep bringing is facts and evidence. And my experience is Working with conflict for 27 years is facts and evidence do not resolve conflict. Any questions about those two fatal myths? Uh, <clears throat> I'll take that as a no. <laughs> well, I got a, I got a quick question. Go for it. On the facts part, um, and it totally makes sense what you're saying. Um, I guess going into the a point at the criminal justice system, like why do they um, why do they lean heavily on the facts then and not that conflict resolution model that you're explaining? And, and that's that your question is why do they do that? Yeah, like why can't they have a better approach doing the conflict resolution style like what you're talking about versus just heavily leaning yeah. on all the facts? The only reason the courts exist is to end a, a dispute. So when I have two people, let's say you and I, this is Wesley, right? Yes. Okay. Wesley, you and I are having a dispute, and I've done everything I can to convince you, and you're not convinced, and maybe you're asking something of me, and I'm not convinced, and we're just arguing back and forth. And the purpose of the courts is, as far as the community health is concerned, you and I cannot continue to function in society or in the community in a healthy way as long as we have this dispute going. The courts exist to end disputes, and what they are saying, and this is all they're, this is the purpose, and all they're saying is if you two can't figure it out, we can't allow it to go on forever. So if you two can't figure it out, come to me, I'll end it for you. Every dispute goes in front of a judge with the presupposition that, judge, we tried. We tried our best, but we couldn't figure it out. We tried, but we can't find a way out of this. 
And the judge goes, okay, I'll find a way out. A classic illustration, uh, it, it's used a lot. I've seen it happen in divorce cases. You'll have a, two, a couple fighting over the furniture in the house, you know, for whatever reason, sentimental value, or they just can't agree on the value of the property, whatever it is. And so they bring a list of all the, all the furniture and the appliances and everything to the judge, and the judge takes the list, looks at it for 30 seconds, tears it in half, and says, this half's yours, this half's yours, handing a half to each person. The two people are outraged. Why would you do that? Why won't you take this seriously? And the judge's comment was this. Once you walked in my courtroom, that furniture was no longer yours. It was mine. I can do with it whatever I want. End of dispute. So my question back, Wesley, is why do we keep going to court when that's their job to end it, why don't we spend more time figuring out ways to resolve our own dispute? And I think if we had the skills and we taught these skills to people, we could be better at resolving our own conflict. Does that help? I agree. All right, let's look at stage two conflict. The, the characteristics are just conflict communication. This thing starts to escalate. My reasonable explanation was rejected. I did my best presentation I knew how to do, and you said no. So now I've got to up this. And I see people drop into three different dynamics. The first one is the person becomes the problem, the other person. The second characteristic I see is people drop into an imbalanced personal state. We'll go through each of these in just a moment. And the third one is both parties drop into what I call a single solution mindset. So one of the things we have to figure out what to do as with techniques is how do I get around these three dynamics? Communication skills are not going to be enough to get around this. If, in fact, if you're not careful, they'll just escalate some of it. So let's look at each one individually. The person becomes the problem. One of the reasons why this escalates, the other person becomes the problem. Let me tell you is in a short sentence what the person becomes the problem sounds like. It sounds like this. Someone turns to the other person and says, you know, the only reason we're having this conflict or this argument or this fight is because you're an idiot. That's the summary of the person is the problem. If you were a rational human being, if you had sense at all, if you were caring, if you had any empathy, if you weren't a narcissist, I mean, all of those make the other person the problem. And what basically you're saying is, had you agreed with me, we wouldn't be having this fight, so there must be something wrong with you because I'm making perfect sense. When the goal of conflict management becomes mutual understanding, when we try to get the other person to understand me, or if a conflict manager or a mediator is sitting in the room trying to get the two parties to understand each other, it only highlights, it, it, it makes this person becoming the problem dynamic rise even more quickly. The techniques that I see people dropping into is arguing facts and arguing values. So I contend that trying to reach mutual understanding in stage one is a brilliant thing to do. But outside of stage one, once you're in stage two conflict, it's not going to help you. You're just going to get more and more frustrated. So people argue the facts, they argue the values, and here's what they end up doing when they're arguing facts. They're arguing over each other's Past fact scenario. I listen to couples argue, debate um, in conflict quite a bit, and this is constantly happening. Well, if you would have only blank, blank, blank. Well, had you not done blank, blank, blank. Well, had you didn't do blank, blank, right? They're all past tense verbs. 
they're spending all their time stuck in the past arguing each other's interpretation, trying to get the other one to understand. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand what really happened was. Or if I could just get you to understand that, that's not what I meant, past tense narrative. What some hope is that if we could just get down to the truth, and that's where we get, we get infatuated with facts. If we could just find the truth, it would resolve this conflict. And my experience of 27 years is the truth does not resolve conflict. In fact, I, when I'm working with people, I assume they're both lying to me. I don't need the truth to resolve a conflict. In fact, okay. I mean, they could both be telling the truth the way they know it. Go ahead. Someone was going to say something? No? Okay. The purpose of these facts is to try to change the other person's behavior, try to change the other person's feelings, or try and change the other person's mind. Do you know how hard it is to change another person's mind? It takes so much energy. And I'm telling you, you don't have to do that. You're going to put energy into resolving a conflict. Don't put it in trying to change the other person's mind or make a person feel something different. That's not the direction to go. When this doesn't work, I see people drop into arguing values. This escalates it, right? I, I, I've tried everything, so let me try the community values. And I'll hear people argue, well, if you really cared about me, well, if you really cared about us, well, if you really cared about the kid, and I could take this into the corporate world just as well. If you cared about the team, if you cared about the project, or in the military, the mission is the most important. Any of us, we start to take the thing that's most important to our community, the community we're in, and we elevate that value and we put it in the other person's face. Time, energy, emotion are all values. Well, you're wasting time. Well, you put making a mountain out of a molehill. Why do you get so emotional? And all those are value-laden statements that we throw into people's face. When the facts don't work and the values don't work, the very next thing that happens all the time is a light bulb goes off in what I call character revelation. Suddenly that person stops, knits their eyebrows, looks at the other person and goes, oh, now I understand. See, in their mind, they're thinking the facts wouldn't convince you. The values won't convince you. You obviously don't care about me or the kids or the project or the team. Oh, you're one of those. And that character revelation always comes with two things. First, a label. That character revelation, well, you're just being unreasonable. Well, you're just mean. Well, you're out to get me. Well, you're a fool. Well, you're a... There's always a label that comes with it, and it always is accompanied with permission to punish. As soon as this label gets placed on this other person, it's always a negative label, and that negative characteristic is always worthy of punishment. Well, you're a liar. Well, liars deserve to be taught a lesson. Right? You're a cheat. Well, cheaters deserve to be, you're selfish. Selfish people deserve to be taught a lesson. And in the mind of the person who's escalated this, right, they're sitting there going, and I'm just the person who could teach you that lesson. And now this conflict takes on a whole new dynamic. It's like, oh, my God, oh, I see it. My mother was right about you. Oh, my God, you know, what everybody's been saying about now I see, oh, I just need to stay away from you. You're a terrible person. Or they start plotting ways to teach them a lesson. It's amazing how many teachers we have out there in every conflict trying to make sure if I don't do something, they'll do this to someone else. They need to be taught a lesson. And that becomes very, very dangerous. Person becomes the problem. We've got to figure out a way to get around that. When none of those work, and this, Wesley, is what you remembered from the negotiations class I was teaching, and that's persuasion techniques. Most Americans are terrible negotiators. We confuse persuasion skills for negotiation skills, and there are literally only four techniques for persuasion. 
threat, punish, shame, and guilt. And people drop into that as that last resort as the person is the problem. Well, if you don't, I'm going to, and the most classic threat we have in our culture, sue you, right? Some version, that's a threat. If I actually sue you, that's a punishment. And shame and guilt, if, I mean, everybody on the phone has parents, so I can only assume that all of you know what shame and guilt means. We've all been a part of that. It's just part of our culture and trying to get people to change their behavior, their feelings, or their thoughts. Any questions about the person is the problem before we move to describe what imbalanced personal state looks like? Okay. Let me go on to imbalanced personal state. I'm going to run through this really quickly. I could do a whole hour just on this this piece alone. Um, everybody, a healthy human being operates out of a balance between their intellect and their emotions. Both provide a data source to us in our decision-making process. But when we drop into conflict, one of those gets squeezed out. Some of us squeeze out the intellect and become very emotional. Others of us squeeze out the emotion to become very intellectual. I happen to be the second. I squeeze out my emotions and become very intellectual. As a white male in this culture, I was socialized into that. And as, a, as an academic, I was trained in this. So, and I did it very, very well. And I could elaborate on the price I paid with that uh, skill, both in my personal and my professional life. We do not want people operating out of an imbalanced personal state. We do not want people making decisions in an imbalanced personal state. In conflict, the stakes get raised and we have a tendency to squeeze one of the things out and we end up making decisions in the midst of that imbalance. We have a gender stereotype in our culture. We tend to associate the emotional ones with women, and that is wrong. I know plenty of men that get push out the uh, intellect and become very emotional, and I know very many women who will push the emotions out and become very intellectual. So the gender stereotype is wrong. The culture bias we also have. We have a tendency to escalate uh, almost to save your status, uh, reason, and rationality. Consequently, when we do that, we have a tendency to demonize emotion. And every textbook I have ever read on conflict management, they demonize emotion. The problem is we just have to set the emotions aside and become rational. That's a very dangerous thing to do. We are very good in our culture of being able to identify the emotional one, we, um, emotional overdrive, but we are not good at recognizing the characteristics of those who have dropped into the intellectual overdrive, those that are cold, calculating, those that have cut off half of their data source and they're all stuck in their head. That's a very dangerous place to be, and here's why. This person is in an imbalanced state, and we don't want them operating, making decisions in that imbalanced state. It is impossible for me to make a decision that would be repairing, a decision that would reconnect you and I together if I am disconnected from myself. The quality of my relationships with others is completely dependent upon the quality of my relationship with myself. And if I am disconnected from myself, either cut off from my head or cut off from my heart, I am not going to make a good decision about being connected to another person. So we have to find a way to work on this. How do we get these people who are out of balance? The problem isn't emotion. The problem is the imbalance. We need techniques not to eliminate emotion. We need techniques to bring the balance back. Any questions about that? 
Oh, that's deep. The last one, single solution mindset. This is probably the one we are most familiar with. It's best characterized as my way or the highway. And people get entrenched. They dig their heels in. They get stuck. And now they're fighting for this one thing. This one, one, the only thing I'm asking for. You know, why can't you just give me an apology? And they get stuck on this one thing. And I know why. I mean, they know the scenario uh, intimately. They, they've evaluated the facts. To them, the scales of justice are imbalanced. And if you'll just do this one thing, the scales will be balanced again. So they get locked onto this one thing, the single solution perspective. And they can't think of anything else. The result that is these people start arguing over each other's solution. Well, you're not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Well, you need to do this. And then they justify and frame over and over and over again, louder with persuasion skills, trying to convince this person to say yes to the one thing they've asked for. They're no longer looking for other ways. It's that one thing that they get locked on. The characteristics of a single solution mindset is a yes or no choice. Will you apologize? No. Yes. Anytime you're given a yes or no choice, you are in a single solution scenario. And I'll show you how to get around that in just a moment. Any questions about single solution? The characteristics then. The people stuck in a single solution end up Stuck in the past. They keep reiterating the facts, thinking that if I do it louder, that it'll change the other person. They end up with the character attack. They end up with circular arguing. If, if you just leave people talking in conflict long enough, they start repeating themselves over and over and over again. Entrenched positioning. Here's how to get around all three of those. First one. How do we get around that imbalanced personal state? What we talk about is venting. We allow people an opportunity to vent in a safe place. I'm not talking verbal abuse. No one should have to stand and take verbal abuse. None of these uh, techniques are a um, armor against verbal, emotional, physical, psychological abuse. But in just the escalated anger and, and uh, loud voices, if the conversation can still keep going, it's the communication skills that you use to create a healthy venting process. And what I teach my conflict managers to do is to be able to use communication skills for what they were designed to do in stage two conflict. Communication skills are designed for one thing and one thing only, in stage two conflict, and that is to keep the door of communication open. Your communication skills will keep that door open, but if you don't have additional skills behind those, you will not have what you need to cross the threshold of that open door into what I call the resolution room. Communication skills will not navigate you through what you do have the obstacles in that resolution room. The reason communication skills become so important is because you cannot resolve a conflict with someone you're not talking to. But when you try and make your communication skills your resolution skills, I've seen it snap the back of those communication skills over and over and over and over again. I've seen people that they're very good with I statements. They're very good at summarizing. They're very good at reframing. Uh, let me see if I, uh, let me summarize what you said. Let me see if I heard what you said. Let me repeat back what you said. And it, that's not the issue. It's not that you're not hearing me. It's that you're not agreeing with me. That's the problem. If I can get you to agree with me, we wouldn't be having this problem. There must be something wrong with you or you would be agreeing with me. We're right back into that whole problem again. So communication skills, I have five techniques that I teach, not going to teach them tonight, 
the five techniques I teach for keeping that door of communication open. The other two dynamics, how do we get around the person is the problem and the single solution mindset? The thing we need to do is need exploration. So many other models, like the court model, is a risk assessment. You measure the risk of, well, should I accept this offer or should I reject this offer? Well, what am I going to get in court? What could I get somewhere else? Therapy is more of a communication assessment. Let's uh, assess our communication. Are we understanding each other? Are we communicating well? With conflict management, we're doing a needs assessment. What is happening here in the conflict is a need is being threatened. And it's not communication skills that's going to get me to that need. It's need exploration skills that's going to help me be able to identify that need. I don't have to go through the person that's problem. I don't have to figure out how to fix that. I don't have to figure out how to fix single solution mindset. I go around to that by doing need exploration. I don't have to drop into the person as a problem. I don't have to argue facts. I don't have to argue value. I have to find out what that need is. Any questions about the three E's and the characteristics of conflict communication? Well, how do you um, make the distinction between the first stage and the second stage? Is there some, uh, is there a, like a, a, a signal or is there a milestone? Is there something that you can determine without a doubt? Yeah. Between the two? Yes. Yeah. Um, as soon as the no comes, Stage two conflict is always initiated with no. Will you give me an apology? No. Will you give me the job? No. Will you be nicer to me? No. So the no means two. No means one. Stage No means that I've rejected your very well thought out justification and framing. And therefore, I'm disagreeing with your facts. And I'm not going to do what you've asked me to do. So now you have to do something else to convince me. Hey, Rick, this is uh, Wesley. With the no thing, um, and tell me if this still applies. Um, I remember, like, when you taught us or when I was in your class, you said, like, no's are our goals. So, like, when we hear the word no, that means that the other person is protecting an interest, and we need to find out what that interest is. Is yes. that still that, is that is still apply? Absolutely, yeah. That is absolutely true. You see, the, what's interesting is all, all conflict, especially stage two conflict, begins with a no. Inside that no, that's what we need to, to do. Inside that no is everything we need to know in order to, to do the need expiration, to find that need expiration. So here's what's happened. Let's take me as a third-party neutral, either as a mediator. Lisa, you're a mediator, right? Lisa? Okay. I think Lisa's a mediator. Um, and if I'm sitting there as a third-party neutral, I've got two people in a room, and this one person has asked for something, the other person said no. Typically, both people have asked for something. Well, notice, the no is a response to the request. The request I explore to find the need, I can also explore the no to find that other person's need. 
So in the negotiations class, I think if you'll remember, most negotiators work incredibly hard to never hear the word no, when really that's where you need to get to as quickly as possible. I think I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to write an article that uh, the title of it is, Please Tell Me No. Tell me no as quickly as possible, because that's, right. that's get, getting to know is not getting past no, but getting to no is really where we start. That's where I really get to roll up my sleeve and really get so to do the talk, work. Are you talking about the back now as far as uh, when the person says no, uh, the stage of negotiation is trying to reach within that zone of a back now? No, I'm not. That that comes much later. That that comes up, but partly is a lot of people misunderstand. And Wesley, you'll remember this. You remember the distinction between an option and an alternative? Oh yes, 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 yes. That and this have to do with alternatives, and we right. we we get there. They're they're very important, but we've got to get to need first, then we've got to get to options. Right. So let me ask you this. Um, we've got we've got eight minutes left. Did anything I describe match your experience in your conflict that you thought about at the beginning of this presentation? Yes. 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 Would anybody be willing to share an example? Sure, I would. This is Chuck. Okay. Hi, Chuck. Hey. Uh, a couple of weekends ago, my wife and I got into conflict. We we facilitate a program together, and we share uh, different aspects of it and share the labor, and um, I mean, we facilitate together. <clears throat> we were visiting some friends, uh, mostly my friends, and uh, I was just sharing and saying, uh, this is what I've been doing. This is what I've been working on. Um, you know, I've been thinking I'm, you know, in a kind of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody and haven't seen them in a while and, um, you know, just catching up. Well, it's brought up conflict in my life or it brought up something very uncomfortable for her and later she shared with me that she felt that I needed to re-language the way I share about it. And it really took me by surprise. <laughs> and in the process of talking about it and working through it, I think we got to exactly what you're talking about. And, it, and what it came down to was her need to be recognized and to be heard and to, felt, to, to feel like she's valued. Yes. And once, once I heard that, I, I learned that I didn't do anything wrong. That I wasn't yeah. a bad person, and for future, for my own future reference, it's going to just make life much better for both of us if I just keep that in mind in the way I talk and express in this particular area. And then, you know, I'm going to try to go ahead and expand it to other areas too um, in our life together. But um, yeah, it was it was definitely a need on her part, and I have the same need. And um, yeah, you know, if she was if she were talking to somebody and only talking about what she's been doing with the program, you know, I might think, well, yeah, I'd I'd, I'd like to get on some of that too. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, That's you're good. Welcome. Thanks for asking. Anybody else? Oh well, uh, this is Roger. Um, uh, Rick, I recently I, I had joined a band because I felt I needed an outlet because I was, you know, so taken up with activities all the time, work, 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 and I felt I needed, needed an outlet. So I was with this band, and um, where they are practicing is of a great concern, even though I didn't voice it. And now I want to pull out, but I'm not really – Sure, they want to accept that because um, 
they had auditioned several keyboard players, and then uh, they I ended up being one of them. There are two of us. So now that I'm in there, in the group, um, and I'm trying to tell them, you know, uh, I have several irons in the fire, they seem to think that um, I am not taking their uh, issues with the band or commitment with the band seriously. Ouch. And I am trying to explain to them that, you know, there's several things going on. Now I'm taking on extra things that I didn't have before, and they're not too happy about it. So, you know, at, at this point, um, I'm still trying. I'm still trying to compromise by going at least once a week. Ah. And, they're, and, and the, the thing is, if they started earlier, they would be such a problem. But they want to start at eight. This is Latonia, and I live in Kennesaw. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so you you did the explanation part, and you justified and framed to the best of your ability. But they still didn't didn't change their feelings about it. No. Got it. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks. That's that's an excellent illustration. I appreciate you sharing that, Roger. Very good. There's three minutes left. I would like to offer everybody on the seminar webinar uh, a free ebook that I wrote. And if you are interested in resolution resistance, a look at unlocking stale mates. I will send you a free copy of that if you will just email me. Can you all see the email address on your screen? Yeah. Yeah. No. No, it's that's Leslie. It's it's cycling through. Um, Dr. Rick V at drrickv.com. If you'll email me a request for that um, ebook, and while you're there, tell me what you thought of the seminar. Uh, give me a little testimony if you don't mind sharing. Um, then I'll be glad to send you a copy, a free copy of, of that ebook. And for those of you who are interested in more, the next webinar is going to be on the heart of conflict. What's really going on? The center of all of these conflicts. What is the? If we get to the heartbeat of it, where would it take us? And so next Monday, same time, 7.30, 8.30, register uh, on my website under the uh, live webinar, same process, Eventbrite, same price. I'd love to have you next week, too. Any final thoughts or questions? I thought one of the most uh, interesting things and new things for me was what you taught about the difference between uh, being an intellectual overbalance or emotional overbalance, but beyond that, I, I mean, I kind of had a grasp on that, but what was really new to me was how you said <clears throat> it's easy to identify somebody in emotional imbalance, and we don't identify as well somebody in intellectual imbalance, somebody who's just in their logic and a little bit disconnected from their emotions or from their heart. And that's that's really eye-opening for me. That's a really interesting yeah, thing that to is. play around with. Cool. Well, thanks. Um, this is Lisa. I have a quick question. Maybe it's not Hi, quick, Lisa. but I'm curious. Um, do you ever, because you've done a lot of mediation, have you ever in all of your mediation dealt with someone who is bipolar, PTSD, schizophrenic, and is it, do you use the same techniques um, for mediating with someone who is maybe um, has this type of condition versus someone who does not? There are variations. Um, the, the, as far as the conflict itself is concerned, these techniques I use 
but somehow, sometimes in those situations like PTSD or bipolar, uh, there are other things we have to work through first, or we have to work through more gently in a different way. So the route I take might be different given that context. Uh, the goal is still the same. The dynamics end up being the same, but the, ro the road I take is different. Now, I notice you've written a lot of books. Have you written anything on that particular subject? No, I have not. And part of the reason is I, I, I work very hard. I don't do therapy. I'm not a therapist. Right. Um, and, and I, I, so I am all about referring folks. So if I'm in a, in a conflict situation, I might refer them to a counselor to go for a while to work on these issues. And then, or I might work on the conflict and then because we've got the conflict out of the way, they can go and work on those therapeutic issues. But the, the line is so often blurred to, in, the minds of the people, uh, the general public, that think what I do is therapy anyways. So I try not to, I, 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 maybe I draw too hard a line in, in that. So no, I don't end up writing on those things very much. Okay. Uh, did you see my article on grandiosity? That's probably the closest I get. So. No, but I'll have to, I'll look at that. Yeah, it was in one. You're on my email list. I sent it out. I think it was in October or August. Um, okay. If if if, oh. if you want, that, let me know. I could dig it up and send you another copy. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh -oh. Is it? Uh, Go ahead. Just Roger. I just have a quick yeah. question. But I remember you said that um, most most conflict managers do not take in account the emotional aspect of the whole issue. Well, by acknowledging that, isn't that itself not therapy? I mean, engagement in, you know, feelings, emotion, isn't that, you know I mean, your technique or your uh, strategy, isn't that not actually hitting from a more therapeutic point of view? Uh, no, I, I would say not. Um, there are therapy... I, I may work on someone's in a conflict, and they're in a conflict because they have a core issue of abandonment, let's say, and and now we're talking about me. Um, I, in a conflict situation, I am sitting there talking about the particularity of this conflict. You got into this because of a particular fear. It's fed by a need, blah, blah, blah. We can talk about that. Why you keep doing that, is a therapeutic issue. How you're going to get to the point of not doing this again, you need a counselor to help you with. I don't do the therapy stuff. I can get you through this conflict. And just because we're talking about emotion doesn't necessarily mean we're in the realm of therapy. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank everybody. We're, we're over time. I don't want to keep you any longer. I want to respect your time. Um, please, if you have any questions further, you've got my email uh, and my contacting information on my website at drrickv.com. So if you want to continue the conversation, shoot me an email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody, does any, you're welcome. Does anybody need a certificate for the continuing education credit? I do. Lisa? Lisa, yes. Lisa, would you add that to your email that you'll send me, and I'll make sure I get you a, uh, a certificate. Anybody Great. else? Thank you or so anybody much. Who's... Oh, you're more than welcome, Lisa, and I'm glad to have you back. Anybody else needs one, just add that to your email. Hey, I look Lisa, forward to hearing uh... from you. <laughs> hey, Take Rick. care. Yes, sir. Thanks. Bye, Lisa. Bye, Sherry. Bye-bye.